course, a discussed talk comes right before lunch, as it should. <laughs> Don't worry, I've uh, toned it down so that we can enjoy our sandwiches. Um, right, um, I'm going to talk about the idea of disgust and whether it's a new thing or not. Going back to our, our good old friend, Paul Ekman, because you've got to bring him up. I'm a historian of emotion. Um, disgust is apparently one of the basic emotions that transcend time and space and the universe, and little aliens on the planet will also have these. Um, and it's, it's everybody has disgust, so you'd expect in the past there to be this emotion. Um, I began researching disgust a while ago to look for it in history and then couldn't find it and got confused. So that's where I come from. So, there are people who don't even think disgust is an emotion. That's the first thing to, th to consider. Um, Jack Panskett, for example, he was asked why he doesn't include disgust as one of his basic drives, because he has uh, various basic emotions that all mammals are supposed to have. And he said, if we consider sensory disgust to be a basic emotional system, then why not include hunger, thirst, fatigue, and many other affective states as the body in the body of emotions. Now, this is a question I've actually been puzzled by because I cannot work out why disgust is sort of an emotion. And I think it's because there is a disgust, which is a yuck or an ear or a fee or whatever word you want to use, that, that feeling you get when something is rotting or off. And there's this other moral thing, and we've tied them together. And somewhere in the middle of that, we've put this into this emotion label. So I'm going to try and look at one of the possible explanations for how this happened, how just something being unpleasant to eat or smell or taste became more than that. Um, One of the things that's interesting about disgust is there are a lot of things, and this is where I've taken a lot of images out, there are a lot of things that people find disgusting in different cultures that we don't in ours. Um, for example, I could have brought along a load of mealworms for you to all try, if you like. Would you like to have some mealworms for lunch, anybody? No, I have done that before. I've also brought along um, energy bars made from flour made from crickets and handed out those in the past. Um, they sound disgusting, and like all energy bars, they are. So, <laughs> but they're fine. They taste like energy bars. Um, why don't we eat those? Um, this is the Disgusting Food Museum in Malmo. I'm going there at the beginning of the next year. It has various cultures' disgusting foods. So, myopia worms, a fruit bat, um, all to be served in half an hour. Um, Kazu Mazura, which is a... Um, cheese with maggots in it. Um, uh, Marmite apparently is in there, which is controversial, I think. Um, but the whole point of the museum uh, is that disgust, food disgust at least, is very much a cultural thing. And to take that to an extreme, Robert, Ro Robert Wilson, in his book The Hydra's Tale, pointed out that the practice of corprophagy have I said that right? I never get that word right. Will not seem disgusting to members of a group such as Sadians or people who enjoy roasted intestines fresh from the hunt who regularly eat excrement in each other's presence. This is the toned down version. Um, so what is universal about disgust? Well, here are various different language versions of this thing. Degu ekel fastidim asko yanu at the bottom, which I again probably mangled the pronunciation of. Uh, Anna Vizabika has suggested in her book that was mentioned earlier that ekel isn't the same as English disgust. It's often translated exactly as disgust, but there are differences to it. For, for example, an old understanding of ekel would include being tickled. And it's more a moving away from something that you don't want to happen to you, that kind of, uh, than it is a, oh, that's disgusting kind of feeling. Very different feeling. And all of these have very different things. Fastidium is the old Roman one. There's a lot of class involved in that, whether you are a particular part of a particular class, make something 
right or wrong is the best way to describe it. The French degout, which precedes our disgust and is more about the suffit, it's more about having too much of a good thing and going beyond that. Um, so even linguistically, it doesn't quite match. So what is disgust? Well, William Ian Miller, the anatomy of disgust is one of the key texts in this field. He thinks it's a complex sentiment that can be lexically marked in English by expressions declaring things or actions to be repulsive, revolting, or giving rise to reactions described as revulsion and abhorrence, as well as disgust. So anything that makes you feel icky or uncomfortable or weird. But he also says the appropriateness, but not the necessity, of accompanying nausea or queasiness of an urge to recoil and shudder from creepiness. So it's quite a wide net he's casting there on a wide range of things that I don't think are all one thing. I think there's a very, there are distinctions between them. I think if you look into the history, you can see that. So these are all the words from history, from before we had the word disgust, I'll get back to that, that William E. Miller thinks would be the same as disgust. You've got abomination, fastidiousness, abhorrence. These one, pa, fi, foot, uh, they're like yuck, so pa, fi, foot. And if you ever want to do a modernization of, um, of the giant, um, fi, fi, fo, fum is the way to do it. So whenever, whenever you tell that story again, you'll tell it differently now. Um, one he focuses on, Miller, is abomination. Now, his claim is that abomination is basically disgust. There's no real difference. If you look in the history, you find that one at the top. The patient felt as abomination, an ache in mouth and stomach. Sounds just like disgust. Almost exactly the same. He loses, misses a word out, though, from the original. The patient felt as abomination and vlotsomeness an ache in the mouth and stomach. Now, vlotsomeness is a very interesting word. It basically means feeling, yeah, um, and feeling like nauseated here. So it's kind of saying it says the patient felt disgust and disgust and ache in the mouth and stomach, if we're to take the definition that Miller's using. So I think here we have an example of two different things, two different aspects being spoken about. The abomination aspect, which is probably a more, if you like, mental idea of it, and the vlotsomeness aspect, which is this physical nausea. They're not the same thing. Um, I mean, later, this is in... Lovely word. It's a word I think we should bring back. It's a beautiful word. Um, it's all over. You find it all over John Trevisor's translations. Um, he talks about the vlotsomeness of drinking milk. He talks about feeling it when you have rotten meat. He talks about feeling it when you're just feeling off. Now, the other word, abomination, now that comes to us through the Latin Vulgate, through translations of the Latin Vulgate, where the older Vulgates would take the word, these words, toba, tabs, chiquits, gal, chakrats, chiquits, and they were all translators as abominatio. So the plot thickens. We now have this one word that I thought was one word and there's another word actually shatters into a whole other bunch of concepts. And these concepts, some of these mean rotting meat. Some of these mean doing a criminal act. Some of these mean doing something against the honour of God. Some of these mean putting the wrong weights on your scales. They have very subtle and different meanings. So now disgust is shattering even further. Now, if we come back into the 17th century, where I live, um, if you look at the words that are found around abomination, if you do a corpus linguistic thing, and you say, here's abomination, what words are used in conjunction with it or close to it? It's these. Lord, God, desolation, wicked, sin, idol. And then we get to something recognisable, filth. The last one is sight. But... And these are all from that biblical origin. These are all religious words. So here we have abomination as a word that is, in the 17th century at least, beginning of it, very religious. It's a religious idea. It's the idea of doing something sinful. Something sinful is an abomination. Something against God. Now, there are some people who would say disgust 
doing something against God is disgusting these days, but it also has other meanings. It's much broader in its term, in its understanding. Whereas abomination, you could say you abhor something, but there's usually somewhere there some kind of religious connotation I've found. So, let's get to Thomas Wright's The Passion of the Mind in general briefly. Now, he has a concept. He, this is a book where he writes about the passions. He talks about what the passions are. It's from 1605, and he analyzes the passion. Now, cut, just to put it in context, he was an English Catholic missionary. He was in England trying to make things better for Catholics. Um, he was... He was also a very big, um, he was very pro-England. He was, he came back to England because basically he got in trouble for saying, no, we really shouldn't kill Queen Elizabeth. That's not the right thing to do to some of his colleagues. Um, and his book, this book has been read as all sorts of, in all sorts of ways. as just a book about passions, a book about manners, a book about behaviour. But underneath it all is this, this is how a good Catholic behaves and this is also how a good Catholic might convert people. And this is what a good Catholic should watch out for. And one of them is a concept called the hatred of abomination. So all of a sudden, abomination is a thing that you hate. It's a sin. It's, it's a negative. And so he says this of hatred of abomination. That first, the person beloved loves back. Excellent. And all those reasons which may stir up his love. And then the hurt of the evil and all the harms it brings with it. So hatred of abomination is a hatred of something, he won't exactly say what it is in early 17th century England, that may harm someone you care about. And the word you use, abomination, you refers to sin. So I'll not fill in the blanks, but let's just say a Catholic in England is saying something's happening to people that he wishes wasn't and wish it could stop happening. But this gives you another example of how, why abomination is different. Now, this happens there are other words out there. All those other words, mawkishness. Words that, we, um, that Miller missed, like aversion. Aversion is used a lot, especially from Hobbes onwards. Aversion is basically avoiding something. Moving fromwards, as Hobbes called it. There's the word eschewing, pushing something away. There is a use of horror, which is something which is so bad you must move it away. Um, there are lots of words that all seem to have little subtle differences. So these seem to have coalesced into disgust, because most of these words we don't use now to mean anything like disgust. We don't very often say someone's an abomination. We're saying it more recently, for a reason, but <laughs> we tend not to. It's an old word. Disgust seems to be the word. So where does this come from? Well, the first time we come across the word John Florio that I and anyone else has really been able to find in English is in a dictionary by John Florio. Now, John Florio is cited as the source of 3,843 words in the second edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. And of those, 1,149 existed no earlier than his work. So he, in the list of people who invented words... I think he's something like, he's 11th. You've got Shakespeare at number one. Viewers. So he came up with words all the time for things, usually in his dictionaries, for things that there wasn't a word to translation for. One of those was disgust. And he translated the Italian sgusto for disgust. Um, and he defined it as a distaste, unkind sgusto is distaste, unkindness, dislike, disgust. <clears throat> Interestingly, when he redid his dictionary, he removed it, as if he went, oh, I don't think anyone knows what I'm talking about. But other dictionary writers of rare words, they started to add it. Um, and they caught, you would usually say it's these two things, distaste and dislike. So the word basically meant something which tastes as bad and something you didn't like. And it was kind of that simple. People would have disgust between them, which meant they didn't like each other. Um, you could dislike a taste. You, you could distaste something because it's horrible. Um, and that seemed to be all the word meant, until Robert Johnson. Now, suddenly, in 1755, there's this new dictionary definition. 
And these are all the different things he put under the heading disgust. Disgust of the palate from anything, ill humour, male violence, offence conceived, to raise aversion in his stomach, to dislike, to strike with dislike, to offend, to produce aversion. And then he said to nauseate, because he suddenly brings nausea into this, to grow squeamish, to turn away with disgust, ill humour. Nauseous was loathsome, disgustful. Nauseously was loathsomely, disgustfully. Nauseousness, quality of it, and so on. So, the question is, why, how do we get from one state of affairs to the other? How is it such a simple little word, and it means so much? I have, I think it's down to taste. I mentioned this earlier. That how we get from this physical disgust to this sort of moral, if you like, is through taste. Now, there's evidence, it happened in Europe before it happened here. There's evidence that the oldest word for disgust in Jewish languages goes back to 14th century France. Degoutier and Degouté appear in a French text on shepherding, would you believe? Uh, Jean de Brise, Le Bon Berger. The following centuries, uh, the aversion of disgust appeared in Spanish, French, and Italian texts. Um, and in England, the word distaste, not yet disgust, appeared. And it took more than a century for it to appear. Now, what was happening around this time in Europe was a lot of thinkers were using taste as a way of denoting morality and ways to behave. They were taking Isidore of Seville, who said taste was... It, something was either nice or it wasn't. It was simple. It was a binary. You like something, you don't like something. And so to work, to have taste, you could, you could be tasteless in the way you behave. Or you could be tasteful. And so they came up with this distaste, which is the exact opposite. It's as untasteful as you can be. And it's the beginnings of this idea that behavior and morality and aesthetics are all wrapped together. Now, in the early 18th century, the English came along and finally got wind of this, and we got a load of taste theorists. Um, and the English taste theorists drew on the usages found in these older words and started to use them in the, the debate about luxury and beauty that was going on. There was, Europe had got richer, luxury was a thing. Bird and Mandeville, who was mentioned earlier, thought luxury was a wonderful thing. It showed that everybody was rich, and if there wasn't luxury, then poor people would starve in a very complicated argument that involves a cycle. Um, and along came theorists who said, well, how do we judge taste? Because some luxury is too much. Some luxury is fine. And so they started to merge this idea of the moral sentiments. Now, the moral sentiments, we've mentioned affections, we've mentioned passions. Another form of emotions, of feelings, that there were, were the sentiments. And the sentiments were basically a judgment. So moral sentiments were a judgment of behavior that you felt. You felt that's a good thing to do. The taste sentiments, the aesthetics, if you like, those sentiments were when you saw something beautiful, you knew it was beautiful. When you saw something that was horrible, you thought it was disgusting. Um, one example of this, I'm only going to take one, is Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, um, who wrote about, who used disgust one for one of the first times in his work Characteristics, 1711. And he discussed the ideas of beautiful beauty and sublimity. Sublimity, I need new teeth for that word again. These objects are not only physical objects, but they could be anything that judge beauty that's recognisable as admirable. So friendship should, could be judged in this way. He claimed that pleasure is no rule of good, since when we follow pleasure, merely we are disgusted and change from one sort to another. He also commented that frequent successions of alternative hatred and love, aversion and inclination, must of necessity create continual disturbance and disgust that not only lose their force, but are in a manner converted into uneasiness and disgust. So for Shaftesbury, we're talking about taste. Disgust was a rejection of a, a, an absolute opposite to beauty, an absolute opposite to good taste. It was as bad taste as you can get. You would feel uneasy, you would feel wrong. And it applied to people's behaviours as well. It had a moral element, as all of these aesthetics did, generally. 
And that, I think, is one of the ways that this jump happened. Now, there are other ideas as how the jump from stuff to happened. Uh, Valerie Curtis, um, she has written recently that disgust, moral disgust appeared because we, she thinks disgust is people avoiding pathogens. We see things, we'll get a pathogen from it, so we avoid it. And when people behave wrongly, we think they've got a pathogen. So it's evolved. Moral disgust evolved. Um, Jonathan Haidt and Paul Rosen, they think, they think it's just a, an embodied action of morality, that we, we use this feeling and it's evolved into a way to protect us from bad people. But I'm not so sure. I mean, Jonathan Haidt's done some wonderful research where he shows that if you have a high sensitivity for physical disgust, you're more likely to be at a political extreme. But that's for another talk. <laughs> um, I think it's a historical moment. I think we co-opted it. I think we borrowed it. And I think it's still really a metaphor. And it's one of many. I think there are lots of other things out there. We can feel aversion for things. We can feel unease about things. We can feel... Um, Abomination for things, even now. Um, we can, and they're all, we have to think of these not as a single thing, but as different aspects. Perhaps, of, perhaps there is a feeling, an ancient feeling that protects us from getting ill, that we've co opted into many things. And I think researching the different bits is important rather than trying to put them all under one umbrella and push them together. A bit like emotions itself, as was discussed earlier. It's a more umbrella thing. Um, and that's basically it for me, because otherwise I'll be going on forever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was... I have to end with a disgusted cat. <laughs>